Good afternoon, everyone. It gives me great pleasure to introduce to you David Greenspoon, astrobiologist. Uh, he's a noted uh, astrobiologist. He is senior scientist at the Planetary Science Institute. He was awarded the Carl Sagan Medal by the American Astronomical Society. And he's published two books, two major books, Venus Revealed and the Natural History of Alien Life. Uh, please give a warm welcome to David Greenspoon. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Good afternoon. Or for those of you who partied till three, good morning. <laughs> I'm an astrobiologist and I'm very interested in what is happening to the Earth right now in a cosmic sense and what that possibly implies for building civilizations throughout the universe. Have you noticed that something strange has been happening to the Earth? I mean, seriously, if you had been watching our planet for, oh, say, the last few billions of years, you would have seen a lot happening, right? The continents drifting around, crashing into each other, coalescing and splitting apart. The polar caps growing and shrinking as the climate oscillates between hothouse and icy conditions. A dynamic changing planet the whole time. And yet, whoa, what is this? The night side of our planet throughout all of these changes, all these billions of years, has been pretty much an unbroken dark. Not completely, a few lightning flashes, some splashes of aurora, um, which you might have caught the other night. <laughs> uh, yay. <laughs> uh, and then in the last few hundred million years, once the continents became forested, the occasional forest fire, but pretty much just dark on the continents all these billions of years. And then suddenly, if you've been paying attention, boom! these spreading networks of lights in this pattern that seems not quite organic. And at the same time, all of these other dramatic changes on the planet, changes in atmospheric composition, in the quality of the land, in, in, in the, the surface of the ice, and the chemistry of the ocean. And then, very recently, just in the last half century, perhaps most strangely of all, little bits of the planet have started launching out back into space where it all came from. These little uh, insect-like metal contraptions with, with transmitters and instruments flying up back off the planet and buzzing around it in nearby space, and some of them even flying off to the neighbor planets and sending radio signals back homeward. So, Again, if you had been watching Earth all this time, you would go, whoa, this is new and different and strange. What's happening on this planet? Well, this is what some scientists now are calling the Anthropocene Epoch, a new geological epoch defined by human activity as a geological force which now is rivaling and in many cases exceeding the other forces of planetary change. And as an astrobiologist, I'm interested in looking at this and trying to characterize this change in the context of other kinds of planetary changes and, and see if it can tell us anything, uh, shed any light on this, this question of the prospect of civilizations throughout the universe. So I, I want to place it in the context of what we call cosmic evolution, the sequence the large-scale sequence of changes the universe has gone through from the Big Bang through galaxies and molecular clouds and stars and planets. Uh, now, all of these are things that we know have happened everywhere. Uh, very recently, we've learned with the exoplanet revolution that, that almost all stars have planets. But what about these last couple changes, the, the origin of life and then complex life and what we so proudly call civilization? Are these also universal sequence, uh, uh, stages that, that are happening throughout the universe that have happened, that can happen. We, uh, we still lack context on, on, on that question, these questions, and that's what, what we're seeking here. Now, I 
am a child of Apollo. I was inspired in the fourth grade by Neil and Buzz stepping off the limb and dancing around on the moon and, and seeing the, the, the real-time television images of that changed my life. And at that same time, of course, there was all this fantastic science fiction going on. And in, in my mind, the two were really uh, indistinguishable. It was all space and the future. Science, science fiction, it was all happening very quickly and very real and, and the future was, a, was approaching fast. And, and this, this feedback between science and science fiction has in fact been, been kind of a theme of my life. Um, when I was, uh, my, my sort of first literary love when I was a kid were these books by Isaac Asimov, the Lucky Star series about mining the asteroids and intrigue amongst the, uh, the rings of Saturn and the oceans of Venus. And I, I was captivated by that and I, I never stopped being captivated and that uh, eventually led me to a career in planetary exploration and, and uh, research as a comparative planetologist, which is basically what I do. Uh, and, and this, I think this is quite common in my field. In fact, one of my mentors, one of my teachers and mentors growing up was Carl Sagan, who of course you, you know about. And Carl was quite the science fiction fan, and he once gave me this story, Microcosmic God by Theodore Sturgeon, which he described as perhaps, I, I think he either said it was his favorite science fiction story or one of his favorites. And uh, it's a great story if you haven't read it, but it involves this scientist tinkering in a lab, um, trying to artificially invent life. And then he succeeds, and he succeeds in speeding up the evolution of that life in the lab such that it, in fact, overtakes the, the, the evolution of life you know, in, in the real world, and then, um, well, things happen. I won't tell you if you haven't read the story, but it's, it's worth checking out. But at any rate, um, one of my first research experiences was as uh, an undergraduate researcher working with Carl in his lab at Cornell, where he, in fact, was doing experiments trying to recreate the origin of life. So again, this is sort of science and science fiction inspiring each other. And oh, well, I have to, this is just, sorry, me showing off here. In, uh, this is from 1985, my copy of the novel Contact, written by Carl Sagan. And he says, for David, who inspired pages 16 through 18. So um, anyways, I, I won't tell you what's on pages 16 through 18, but if you want to know how Ellie Arroway, the, character, the main character in Contact, is part me, then go to pages 16 through 18 of the original hardcover of Contact. But anyways, um, good science, like good science fiction, like a good story, starts with a question. The question is, what if? And, uh, and then the narrative or the research follows from that. And in my own research as an astrobiologist, uh, some of the problems I've studied are, have been more what you might consider more mundane, just problems of atmospheric evolution and trying to understand how planetary environments change over time and where uh, the universe might be suitable for life. But a couple of projects I've done have been in this, this very speculative vein of trying to imagine the life that might exist on other planets. And I've actually published some peer-reviewed uh, studies of this, which have, some of which have found their way into science fiction. And it's just kind of fun, this, this, this uh, I, I, I mention this because I'm talking about this, this cyclic feedback between scientists and fiction writers. And just really quickly, and I won't go into detail, but these papers are on my website, which is just funkyscience.net, if you find yourself interested in wanting to check them out. But uh, with some um, colleagues, I, I have written about possible life on Titan and how that might work, how it might take advantage of the environmental properties there, of Saturn's moon, Titan. And I've also uh, written some papers about possible life in the clouds of Venus. And again, you know, sort of plausibility, what it's really like there and how life might operate in that environment. And the fun thing uh, for, for this discussion is that some of these have turned up in science fiction stories and I've been acknowledged by some writers. In fact, this Ben Bova book is uh, dedicated to me, which was very lovely of Ben. Uh, and, 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 and in some of these stories, some of these, some of these sort of more speculative scientific ideas that I've, I've 
managed to publish have found their way, and to me that kind of completes the cycle of having been inspired by science fiction as a kid and then doing science, which some science fiction writers are finding um, provocative or, or, or useful. Um, oh, and this is uh, from my book, Venus Revealed. This is um, uh, an artist, the, art, the artist is Carter Emmert, wonderful space artist, um, who works at the uh, Hayden Planetarium in New York now, is the head of um, astrovisualization or something cool like that. But anyways, um, he, uh, he did this drawing of a, um, a research station in the clouds of Venus that I talked about in the, at the end of this book, which again has sort of found its way into some, some fiction. So it's just, it's just kind of fun, this, this sort of uh, um, mutual um, inspiration and, and feedback that sometimes occurs between these worlds. Now, in my career, I've ended up uh, being part of some planetary missions, missions to Mars and Venus, and modeling uh, what, we, what we call comparative planetology, trying to get insight on what's happening here on Earth, partly by, by seeing the broader context of the, the life histories of similar planets that are different in interesting ways. And, and in particular, I focused a lot on Venus and Mars because those are the two most Earth-like planets we know. And we can do things like look at similar features. Here, these are river deltas on Venus, Earth, and Mars. And in some ways, they have striking similarity. But then when you start looking at the details, they're different in the details. And those differences tell us of the different stories and what's happened to these planets. And of interest for, for the topic that I now want to veer into here is that Amongst all these planets which had very similar beginnings, apparently, something remarkable happened on this planet in the middle. Life happened. Why here? Something we, we have some good clues about, but we're still trying to understand. And then four billion years later, the planet went through another transformation I think of potentially of equal significance in the evolution of the cosmos, and that is this happened, what we call civilization. Again, why here? And if we can get to that question of why here and where this is all going here, maybe that will help us with this question of where else in the galaxy might something like this be happening. Now, I mentioned this has been called the Anthropocene Epoch by scientists. Some people don't like that term because it seems very arrogant and self-centered. Why should we name a geological period after ourselves? How obnoxious is that? And you know, they've got a point. <laughs> but it's also true that if you look at what's happening on the planet, just the geometry of the surface of the planet is changing in these bizarre ways. And then you look at all these natural systems, these previously natural systems, the hydrological cycle is really torqued from what it's ever been. There is now about between five and six times as much water behind dams in reservoirs as there is left in all the freely flowing rivers and streams on the entire planet. That's not a minor change in the hydrological cycle. Similarly, you can look at the nitrogen cycle, the phosphorus cycle, obviously the carbon cycle, uh, and the chemistry of the ocean, all these things. And there's something really major happening. And I think by, by naming it the Anthropocene, we at least sort of acknowledge our role in this. And maybe that's even a first step towards taking responsibility and kind of growing up to be the kind of species, the kind of civilization that purposefully guides its role in the planet rather than sort of stumbling through it. But it is true that we are not the first species to come along and radically change the planet. In fact, other species have done it. In fact, for instance, two and a half billion years ago, these little guys, the cyanobacteria, came along and basically wrecked the planet. They started, and by the way, they were doing what we are doing, uh, trying to exploit a new energy source. In their case, it was solar energy. They were like, oh, great, photosynthesis. And they started liberating this poisonous gas that then filled up the atmosphere and wiped out 
a large number of species that were alive at that time caused a horrible mass extinction, and that dangerous poisonous gas was O2, oxygen, and which we like. I love oxygen, I won't lie, but uh, we had to evolve to the point where we could metabolically take advantage of those intense reactions between oxygen and organic matter, which is how we live, but species that were living uh, the way life lived previously that had, did not have that ability died out in droves when oxygen came along and started reacting with their organics and wrecking the machinery of life. So it wreaked havoc before it became something that could be exploited by us. Not only that, but uh, it's even worse. These irresponsible cyano, planet wrecking cyanobacteria, they even caused a major climate crisis. Uh, you maybe have heard of Snowball Earth. Uh, there have been a few times when the Earth became completely frozen over, caused mass extinction, and the Paleoproterozoic Snowball Earth, a little over two billion years ago, was probably caused by that same rise in oxygen um, due to those evil, greedy cyanobacteria who flooded the atmosphere with oxygen and destroyed the methane greenhouse, which was probably then keeping the Earth warm. So, uh, as I said, other species have come along and done nasty things to the planet. Now, in reality, we don't think of the cyanobacteria as evil or bad or irresponsible because, well, because they're just bacteria. But yet we see ourselves behaving in some of those same ways and we go, Wow, what are we doing? How irresponsible. And, and so, but, but what really is the difference? Uh, it's an interesting question because it's just one way of, of looking at, you know, what is going on here on Earth? How do we characterize that in some way where it's not just about bipedal human beings, but some kind of transition that can happen on a planet in a way that allows us to think about applying it elsewhere? And so, in order to further thinking about that, I've been looking at all the different kinds of catastrophic changes, the major changes that can happen to planets, Earth and other planets, and try to, trying to sort of categorize them. And I've decided there are, I will, I will now submit to you the idea that there are four major kinds of planetary change. And I'll describe them. And, and what I mean by that really is these are categories of planetary change with respect to the role of life and the role of mind in, in those changes. So here are my four kinds of planetary change. The first is what I just call random or accidental change. Uh, the kinds of things that just happen because we live in sort of a, 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 a sometimes violent universe um, the, the bumper sticker for this kind of planetary change is shit happens. Um, obviously, the, cana the canonical example is the asteroid impact. Uh, you know, a planet's in the wrong place at the wrong time. Something big happens. Something big comes in from space, moving at a high velocity, and ruins your day and causes a mass extinction. And this obviously happens 65 million years ago, wiped out famously the dinosaurs, but in fact about 90% of all species at that time. And this has happened repeatedly through Earth history and happens to all planets because there's, there's stray material out in space left over from forming the planets. Uh, it's, this is not the only example of this kind of random change. There are, for instance, uh, um, occasional episodes of massive volcanic outpourings due to uh, uh, sort of burps that happen in the Earth's interior, what we call large igneous province formation. Uh, the, the, the major, uh, these, these major volcanic areas like the Deccan Traps in India and the Siberian Traps in, um, in Siberia, um, where um, historically there were these outbursts of volcanism which also caused huge climate changes and mass extinctions. And I would also put those in this category of random changes. The major point is that for these for this category of change, life has nothing to do with it. Life is just an innocent bystander. It's not implicated, it's just in the wrong place at the wrong time. Now the next category of change is biological changes, 
where in fact life itself, the evolution of life, exploiting some environmental quality leads to environmental consequences which then are fatal for large numbers of other species, mass extinctions caused by life itself. And I symbolize this with the green leaf because I already gave you the example of photosynthesis, which is probably the best example of this where life comes along, says, ah, solar energy, and starts doing what life does, multiplying, and causes this, uh, you know, this unintended consequence of uh, changing the environment in, in a way that is fatal for other species. And there, there actually, when you start looking at the record of Earth history, there are several mass extinctions where life is implicated. So this is, this is actually, a, I think, a legitimately a category of change. Now, the third kind of change I will submit to you is what I call, uh, oh, and the, yeah, examples of biological change. I already mentioned the cyanobacteria and the snowball Earth. Um, now, the third category is what I call inadvertent technological change. And this is what's happening now on Earth. And I symbolize it here by traffic. All of these drivers are in control of their own car, solving problems, like in this case, how to get from Berkeley to Alameda during rush hour. But is anybody in control of the global transportation system? This is the kind of change that you get when you have a species which is very good at using technology to solve local survival problems, like how to get food, shelter, transportation, and in fact is so successful with that kind of technological solution that they then start to induce global changes with that technology, at first having no idea that they are doing so. And I think that this will actually always be a quality of technological life on a planet, that it starts off as, a, as something that's great for solving local problems. And why should you have any idea of global consequences when you're first using technology? You likely don't even know that you live on a globe takes, we didn't really know that until we had the technology to go into space or even, you know, started to do circumnavigation. But the point is it takes a certain level of science and technology to even have that realization that it will give you the consciousness that you, that you live on a globe that you could be changing. So I think this kind of inadvertent change is actually probably a natural stage. And, and in, this, in this stage, we have this quality where we are clearly global actors but we don't necessarily have any sense of global awareness or consciousness or pur purposefulness. It's almost as if when we look at ourselves acting globally and we talk about what we're doing, it's almost like, like a dream where you can see yourself behaving in a certain way, about to step off a cliff or committing some crime, but you can't change what you're doing. You're sort of observing yourself in this semi-conscious state. And this combination of global influence without global control is what I call the Anthropocene dilemma. That's the dilemma we're in now. And just some examples. And I understand this is really a, a nerd crowd, so I don't have to explain things so I can whip through some things, but you probably are familiar with the Keeling curve and you know about CO2 and all the things that are happening now um, to the climate uh, and potentially happening, so I won't really talk about that at length. But uh, another example, an interest, and there are several examples of these, these kind of inadvertent changes. Another interesting example, of course, is the, the ozone hole, which, by the way, we first discovered partly because we were exploring Venus and found some weird things happening with chlorine and oxygen in the atmosphere of Venus and said, oh, well, what about all that chlorine we're putting into the stratosphere on Earth? Oh, oops. Um, so... So planetary exploration has a lot of sometimes uh, important side benefits. But, uh, but the ozone hole is an interesting case also because uh, you know, we, we realized we were doing it in the 70s and in the 80s we passed um, successfully uh, passed uh, global um, regulations and treaties and agreements. There was a, a global discussion about this and there were um, meetings held and scientists came up with solutions and treaties were, were formed. And so... Um, the ozone 
While it's definitely an example of this kind of inadvertent change, it's also, I think, a great example of what I call the fourth kind, planetary changes of the fourth kind, which are intentional changes. Because ozone is an example of a situation where, as I said, we saw what we were doing, scientists sounded the alarm, we had global meetings and discussions about this, and um, actions were taken and agreements were made, and for the most part, they've been honored. And the ozone, it's a, it's a success story. We're not done yet. We have to be vigilant and stay on track. But the ozone hole is on its way to being fixed. And believe me, if, if, it, if we hadn't noticed this and hadn't figured out how to fix it, it, it could have been very bad and very scary. Uh, one of the reasons why Mars today doesn't seem to have a lot of surface life is because Mars doesn't have much of an atmosphere, or in particular, an ozone layer, and is bathed by the kind of solar radiation, the sterilizing solar radiation, the mutating solar radiation that the ozone, uh, thankfully, protects us from. And it's one of the reasons why there is life on land on Earth. There wasn't before we had an ozone layer. So this was, this was good. Bravo, humanity. Score one for us. Um, <laughs> thank you. Yes. <laughs> Yay, humanity. <laughs> Sometimes we avoid screwing up. <laughs> um, but <laughs> now I'm going to give you some other examples. No. Um, so other possible examples of intentional change. Well, obviously now we're having a global discussion about global warming. And people, when I say that, sometimes I get, you know, sort of sardonic chuckles. Ha ha, global discussion. We're so screwed. But in reality... I think the fact that we are, this is on humanity's radar now. We are having a global conversation about this that was absolutely not true 20 years ago. And there's a lot of consternation. Is it too little, too late? Do we know how to solve this? But it's on our radar. And a global, there is global awareness of this and a lot of smart people thinking about solutions. And that is a very, very important first step. So the fact that there is now a global conversation about this on the, you know, on the large-scale cosmic kind of time frame that I'm trying to think from here, this is actually a very hopeful sign. Now, going to longer time scales, other examples of intentional change, uh, one important one is planetary defense. We do not have to go the way of the dinosaurs because, unlike them, we have a space program. And, in fact, there are people, a lot of my colleagues, working on this question of... Um, how do we find the dangerous asteroids out there? Um, comets, too. Comets are actually a harder problem in some ways. Um, and what are we going to do about them? And, and, and there are, we, we do have ways to mitigate this problem. I, I consider this, in a sense, no longer a threat. I mean, it still is, but I, I, I fully believe that we know how to deflect a dangerous asteroid and that if a truly civilization threatening one was coming towards Earth now, that we would not go the way of the dinosaurs. So we still have work to do to, to finish this project, but there's no magical physics involved. We know how to do this. So this is a really significant change in Earth history that from now on, as long as we or our descendants are on the case, the world no longer has to worry about this source of mass extinction. I even think we could regard this in the long run as a kind of payback to the biosphere. Yeah, we are causing a mass extinction right now, and that really sucks, and we all have some responsibility to see if we could, you know, have it be a, at least a minor mass extinction as opposed to a major one. It may be too late to prevent a mass extinction in some, some regards, but we may likely, in the long run, if we, keep our, if we get and keep our act together, we may be able to prevent the next mass extinction, the next asteroid or some other um, natural cause that without, uh, w without a sentient technological spacefaring species on the case would be catastrophic for Earth. So in the long run, we may be able to, to uh, sort of uh, change the ethical balance and have our presence here be something that... Uh, that uh, is, quote, good for the Earth. I realize all these terms are loaded. Um, now, moving on to other possible examples of intentional change. There is a kind of climate change beyond the kind that we are inducing right now that happens to Earth regardless of any, whether anybody like us is around. And 
it's not, how do I put this politely? It, it's, well, no, I mean, it would be really, really um, terrible if, uh, to experience. It's not something you want to your species or your civilization to go through. We have been very lucky in this 10,000 years of this project of human civilization. It's been a pretty, a time of pretty warm, stable climate. But over longer time scales, the climate of Earth is capricious. It goes through really dramatic swings. Life has survived these, but our civilization is actually m much more fragile than our species or other species. And we do not want to live through another ice age where most of North America, large parts of North America are under a mile of ice. It's a fallacy to think that climate by itself is this lovely natural thing and that we technological humans are you know, the, 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 you know, doing this horrible thing and that if left alone, the climate would be fine. That may be true on some small time scale, but over a longer time scale, it is the ability and I would say the responsibility of sentient life to do something about this. And I was interested uh, as uh, approaching this meeting and learning something about, about Eve and the Eve world, I was interested to, to learn that the time scale is something like 20,000 years in the future. Because that is a time scale when not only will we likely be deflecting and mining and using right. asteroids, but the Milankovitch cycles, the natural climate cycles are these 10,000, 20,000 year cycles. We might, given the current cycle, have 50,000 years. But the point is, on that rough time scale is when, if we're around, we will have to do this kind of tinkering. Uh, and, you know, so people talk about geoengineering, which obviously goes in this category of intentional change. Personally, I'm wary of geoengineering as a quick fix to the climate. Why? Because we don't know what the hell we're doing. And take it from me as a climate modeler, there's so much we still don't understand about the planetary climate system. And so to me, doing really uh, sort of extensive near-term geoengineering is crazy because that's like trying to fix an airplane while in flight saying, hey, I'm gonna redesign the engine even though I don't really know how engines work. It'll probably be okay. Uh, you don't wanna tinker with your one, the, the system that you're dependent upon until you understand it better. But I would submit by the time we get to these, this 10,000, 20,000 year time scale, if we're still around, we will not only know how to do geoengineering well, but we will need to, and it will be our responsibility to. Now, um, in this same category, I'm not gonna go through all this, I, some of this is repeating what I've just said, but there's also terraforming. And obviously in this crowd, I don't have to tell you what terraforming is, but the notion that we could take a planet like Mars and make it Earth-like is one that's obviously been around in a long, for a long time in science fiction. And we planetary scientists have had workshops and meetings and talked about how would we do this. And terraforming is another thing, sort of like geoengineering, where I would not recommend trying it on the short term. Fortunately, I don't think we really, no, anyone's got immediate plans and we don't really know how to do it. But again, on a longer time scale, it may be something that we not only want to do, but you could argue would even have an ethical imperative to do. If we really find out that Mars is dead, for instance, and we value life and want to spread life and want to ensure the survival of Earth life, then it might be uh, ethically correct and morally incumbent upon us to create um, habitats for Earth life on other worlds. So in the long run, terraforming I think it's a positive thing to think about. But on the short run, I think it's also very valuable to think about in the sense that by modeling terraforming, by having these workshops where scientists get together and say, okay, well, how would we intentionally alter the climate of a planet? That's the way we need to be thinking about our own planet. Because even stopping inadvertent tinkering is a kind of intentional change. In other words, rather than this saying, well, we're changing the planet just by accident because we're doing stuff and not really thinking about it, obviously to have a long-term civilization, we need to move to the phase where we are changing the planet, not where we're hands off. That's the mistake that some environmentalists make, say, oh, well, everything will be fine if we're hands off. I don't think that would work, but we need to be 
hands-on and minds-on. In other words, have a sort of more, ultimately a more conscious and intentional way of interacting with the planet technologically. And so that's, again, I think the, the mental, the intellectual exercise of terraforming is a really good step in just getting us to think about, well, how, what would that look like? How would we intentionally interact with a planetary climate system rather than sort of inadvertently veneriforming the Earth? which is sort of what we're doing now. And then ultimately in the very long time scale, we're gonna have to deal with the sun and the fact that it's changing and getting hotter and will uh, ultimately make uh, Earth go the way of Venus. Now we're talking a billion, two billion years in the future. Nothing to lose sleep over perhaps, but this is in the same category of change going out longer in the future. Ultimately, I think if we, or any civilization becomes that kind of entity where technology is employed as a, term, as, as a tool of long-term global survival, then at that point, when something starts to happen to the sun in a big way that will make Earth uninhabitable, we will either have the tools to possibly alter the sun, but certainly do more aggressive um, terrestrial interference, but I think even more importantly, at that point, we will have become a multi-planet and perhaps even multi-stellar civilization. And so this, if we're around on that kind of, kind of time scale, billions of years, I don't think this will be a problem because if we have developed in the way that will be necessary for us to survive for that long, we will have the skills to deal with it. So if you now, if you wanna get a little nerdy about this, you could even chart all this on a logarithmic time scale. Um, and and um, so here are things that are being modeled, actually being dealt with, uh, we're at least uh, on track or problems that are solved. Oh, I didn't mention this, but I think something like the smallpox vaccine is an intervention. It's a planetary change of the fourth kind. And um, that is good. <coughs> we may think of extinction as bad in general, but here's an extinction we caused that, again, I don't think anybody's going to Mourn. Okay, there's still smallpox alive in a couple of laboratories. Uh, hopefully only a couple of laboratories. <laughs> um, we don't know for sure, but, but in general, we've done a pretty good job with that one. Uh, so I regard that as a, as a problem that's solved. Ozone is on track. Global warming in the next hundred years, one way or another, we're going to deal with it. Um, and possibly by geoengineering. Planetary defense, certainly uh, in the next several hundred years, we will have systems in place. Um, ice age interference, definitely on the scale of tens of thousands of years. And then ultimately solar evolution is something we don't have to deal with it until you know, some, some billions of years. But to me, this all goes in the same category on different time scales of this notion of becoming the kind of civilization that makes intentional planetary scale changes. So now when we come back to the Anthropocene, there's a lot of debate now, you might have seen in Nature Magazine and other places, about when did the Anthropocene start? We could talk about that. Was it the Industrial Revolution? Was it the atomic bomb? Blah, blah, blah. I mean, they're all interesting ideas. To me, that debate is kind of boring. It doesn't really matter when it started. I mean, it's sort of interesting, but the point is it's here. We have to deal with it. To me, the more interesting question that I don't think enough people are talking about is when will it end? Or will it end? Or how will it end? In other words, if you think about the Anthropocene as a geological stratigraphic term, think of the different layers of rock, the different times, uh, time periods in Earth history, and then add on the top of that layer cake, add what's happening now, this, this layer of rock with you know, Twinkie wrappers and Eve meeting badge holders and hubcaps and you know, this stuff they're gonna dig up way in the future. Uh, you know, how, do, how does that rate as a geological time period? Is it simply an event which will be a thin layer like that boundary between the Cretaceous and the Tertiary when the dinosaurs got wiped out? Will it be something longer like an epoch which lasts, you know, tens of millions of years possibly? Or could it even be a planetary transition, something like the origin of life where the rules changed, where there was a before and after in planetary history which were completely and sort of permanently and fundamentally different. Well, I vote for planetary transition, that it's at least possible that starting with us, mind, awareness, and technology will have a role in the functioning of the planet from here on out through the rest of the planet, through the rest of the, of the planet's history, the rest of planetary time. But of course, we're not there yet, but 
we do have a choice, as um, Sarah Connor carved into that picnic table before she went off and killed um, Dyson. Um, there is no fate but what we make. The future is unwritten. And so, uh, you know, it's not a foregone conclusion how long this Anthropocene will last. This could be the beginning of a planetary transition. It's fun to think about the geological time scale with our eons and eras and periods and epochs. And the, the Anthropocene has been proposed as a new epoch that will go after the Holocene, which is the Holocene basically began at the end of the last ice age and is really when, you know, human civilization is, is thought to have sort of in its very embryonic stages begun. Um, but I'm interested in the possibility that, in fact, it may be something more fundamental than that. It could be the beginning of a new eon, if you, uh, what, what I call a sapiozoic eon, the time of awareness being part of how the planet operates. If you look at these different eons, there's, there's different ways to slice it, but basically, the, from the Hadean to the Archean, this is more or less uh, the origin of life. From the Archean to the Proterozoic, this is more or less the rise of oxygen. Um, and the, from the Proterozoic to the Phanerozoic, this is the, what we call the Cambrian explosion when, when uh, animal life and complex life happened. And then, could this be the beginning of, of uh, you know, what's next? Um, I, it's fun to think about a geologist coming back here, maybe an alien geologist in a few million years and, re and writing the rest, or a few hundred million years, writing the rest of this chart. Um, but I like to fantasize that maybe this is the beginning of, of the Sapiozoic Eon. Now, in order to get to that point, though, we have to s survive the next couple of centuries. And there are some problems we encounter. And some very smart people, like Martin Rees, uh, Sir Martin Rees and E.O. Wilson, you may have seen some of these books and some of these projections. There's this notion of a 21st century bottleneck where we have to deal with all of these problems, many of which are of our own making population energy, loss of biodiversity, runaway development of um, some potentially scary technologies, nano, bio, cyber. Yeah, you may know what the gray goo problem is. Um, and, uh, you know, the idea of a runaway um, self-reproducing agent that basically eats the biosphere. That, that wouldn't be good. Um, so, uh, oh, and, 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 you know, if it weren't even for all that, to, to add on top of that, we have to worry about the zombie apocalypse. I mean, you know, let's face it. These are scary times. Um, and this is what some people have referred to as the 21st century bottleneck. And there's, a, you know, there's a related quality to all these problems that, you know, we are either going to sort of grow up and get a handle on ourselves and be able to be able to work with, you know, having these very powerful planet-changing technologies and use them as a, poten as, a, as a potent source of survival. And obviously, given examples that I've already been giving you, asteroid defense, um, ice age prevention, there are ways in which all this technology can be a huge, uh, unprecedented uh, source of uh, of survival, of, of persistence for a species that no species has had before, but there are also these threats, and that's why there's this notion of a bottleneck, that there's this sh sort of short time scale where you have to get through, but if you emerge on the other side, you will have the qualities of a planetary civilization that has potentially very long lifetime, because not only will you, well, because you'll be, in addition to having all these nifty abilities, you will be immune from most and once you become multi-stellar, maybe immune from all natural disasters and have a lifetime of your civilization, which is essentially infinite. You'll essentially be immortal. And I call it quasi-immortal because we don't know if the universe is infinite, but it's still you know, pretty long. There's a, there's a song um, by um, one of my favorite bands, NRBQ, called Immortal for a While. And that's how I, how I think of it. Um, so now, we come to the point where you can think about SETI, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, and how do some of these considerations that I've been talking about, about the human future, manifest when we think of them as uh, affecting populations of potential civilizations throughout the galaxy or the universe. And it may be, if you buy into this bottleneck notion, and I do buy into it, it may be that there's kind of a bifurcation in the lifetime of civilizations. There are those that are maybe somewhat short-lived, um, which you could represent as a, um, as a Gaussian distribution. And I feel like in this uh, 
audience, I'm not losing too many people when I say that you could represent as a Gaussian distribution, which is great, because then I can press on with making my point. Um, and then there's this other very, very long-lived tail. You can you look at the, and I have a, I don't think I have it up here, but this chart, um, maybe I have it on my next slide. No, I don't. But so picture um, that distribution of lifetimes, there's a Gaussian, and then there's this off the charts, um, the ones that make it through the bottleneck who are essentially quasi-immortal. There's this whole other population. And the interesting thing is the transition to that immortal state doesn't have to be very probable. It can be almost completely improbable, very tiny probability, and yet over time the immortals accumulate because once they are formed, they persist. And wh what do I mean by quasi-immortality? Well, you, you know, deep understanding of nature, ability to forestall natural disasters, etc. cetera. Um, and so the interesting point of this, uh, about this is if you do the math, then you find that even if most civilizations at our stage are doomed to self-destruction, then some small fraction could make the transition. And what are the consequences of that? Well, again, you, you probably are familiar with the Drake equation, a lot of you, and I'm not going to go into that. But it turns out that it's not a steady state situation. That if there's this long tail, and again, it doesn't have to be very probable, of civilizations ac achieving this mature, immortal status, then they start to accumulate over time. And if, here's where it gets really freaky, if the wise old immortal civilizations, if any of them are at all interested in helping the young, dumb, proto-wise, um, you know, uh, adolescent technological civilizations like us, then the problem becomes non-linear and you can have this crazy thing like a phase transition where all of a sudden the universe at some point in its history goes from having almost no sentience to sentience elsewhere. You, you, you can play with this mathematically and you can come up with all kinds of fun solutions. But one consequence of this for me is this weird, you know, people a lot of times ask me, well, you think about this a lot, are you optimistic, are you pessimistic? And for me, it sort of depends on what side of the bed I wake up on that morning. But there's this way that you can have this kind of cosmic optimism. Because one thing this does is it tells you that even if most civilizations at our stage are doomed, then it's likely that the civilization is still increasingly permeated with wise civilizations. So it sort of decouples our prospects from the universe's prospects. If you, and, and again, you can do the math of this. It can be very improbable, but if it's a finite probability, you still get, get a solution like this. If anybody can figure out how to survive with technology and really use it to work for them, then there ought to be an increasing number of these wise old civilizations out there. So th there's this quote um, I sometimes use when people ask me about hope, because the implication of this is that you know maybe we're doomed, but we can be doomed and the prospect for um, civilization in the universe is still very bright. So, um, so there's this quote from, from Franz Kafka and he said, hope? Oh yes, there is plenty of hope, but not for us. <laughs> so, you know, I suppose that's one way of looking at it. But anyways, when we think about the human influence on Earth, a lot of people, again, in the environmental community, some environmental communities don't like the notion of the Anthropocene because they don't like the notion that humans are in some sense in control. They think it's arrogant and dangerous thinking and so forth. Um, and as I've been trying to indicate to you, I don't share that view. I do think there's a danger in arrogance and inadvertent tinkering and acting in ways that we don't know what we're doing. But I also believe in the ability of human beings to learn and use this very powerful technology in also very powerful and positive ways. Now, when you look at the language people use to describe the human imprint on Earth, a lot of the metaphors we use are very, very negative. We're a cancer on the planet, we're a virus, we're criminals, we're murdering other species and raping the rainforest, and you know, all these very negative, dark metaphors. And obviously there's a certain truth to these. You can see where these come from. If you look at our patterns of development on the planet, there is a sort of cancer-like, out of control quality. And yeah, when I hear about the, um, the wild populations of, of elephants, being near extinction because there's some fad in China where people think there's an aphrodisiac. And, you know, there's like these, these things really do seem like crimes and make me mad when I hear about these, these things that are happening. And yet, I think that there's a danger in just propagating this 
negative view of ourselves. It doesn't tell the whole story and it can actually lead to this kind of nihilism where it seems like a self-fulfilling prophecy where we don't feel like we are empowered to affect our future. So one thing that I've been doing as part of this, I am writing a book about all this and a sort of um, sidelight of it is I'm, I'm trying to think about and help propagate different metaphors for the role that we think of ourselves. Ones that are true and accurate as these all contain a grain of truth, but are perhaps more positive and uh, you know, highlight a different side of ourselves. And none of these, or most of these are not original to me, but obviously there's a sense in which we're like babies. You know, here we are waking up on the planet going, oh, you know, what do we do with this? There's a brand newness to ourselves and our, our abilities. Or uh, I kind of like this one, if you think of yourself as, um, Think of driving a big rig down a road, and you, but you wake up and you're at the wheel of this big rig and you've never driven before and you don't know how to drive, but you're driving and you go, well, I better learn how to drive this thing and you know, everybody's gonna die if I don't. And um, you know, it's scary, but there's a certain truth to that. We are in this position that we didn't necessarily seek of in a sense being planetary managers. You can also, in a certain sense, look at us as the emerging nervous system of the planet. Or, and I kind of like this, somebody pointed out in Scientific American recently that we always talk about the footprint. What about the human handprint on Earth? Because that acknowledges the fact that, you know, it's our hands, of course, with our opposable thumbs that uh, give us some agency and make all of this possible. But I'm gonna um, end this part of the talk with one last metaphor that I think some of you guys might be able to relate to because uh, it comes from science fiction, and it's actually my favorite way of thinking about this. You know probably about the notion of a generation ship, that one solution to the problem of interstellar travel. Uh, you know, there may be, we maybe we'll figure out how to do it with wormholes and warp drive and jumps and all that, and that would be really cool. I'm not holding my breath, but I'm not opposed. If some of you guys figure it out, more power to you. <laughs> I'll, I'll sign up, I wanna go. But let's assume uh, you know, and a lot of people in science fiction have assumed that that problem doesn't get solved. But that doesn't mean we can't be interstellar. It just means we have to be interstellar on a longer time scale. And that's the notion of a generation ship, of course, where the people who finally reach those other star systems with those habitable planets or those planets that we can terraform and make habitable are the descendants of those who originally set out for those other stars and that the ship is this large, self-repairing, self-maintaining, enclosed, world-like environment that can support multiple generations of human beings with large enough populations to be genetically viable and all that. But usually in these stories, to make them interesting, something has happened, something's gone wrong, there's been a discontinuity Either there was a revolution or a mutiny or a malfunction and the people there have forgotten who they are and what they are and what their mission is. And for all they know, their ship is the entire world. It just is the world that they live in. And then usually our protagonists, our heroes, somehow discover this. They find a control room they find a porthole, they look out and they see the stars and they go, oh, wow, we're, on a, we're all on a ship. We're all going somewhere. And not only that, we have to tell everybody, we have to wake up and spread this information and we have to figure out how to drive this thing or we're all in trouble. Now in a certain sense, I think that that's our situation as humanity now on this planet. We've finally, started to figure out our true situation. We have the scientific revolution. Now we've seen the stars and we've figured out for the first time really in the last few hundred years, the real nature of our world and that we're on a world and that we're moving through space and dependent on its life support systems. And we're going, oh wow, we're on a world and we're sort of in control. We need to learn how to drive this thing. We have to wake everybody up and do this. And so, this is perhaps my, my favorite metaphor, that we are on a generation ship and um, that as we move into the future, we have to wake up and, and learn how to drive it. Now, some of this comes down to your view of human influence in the universe. <laughs> Whoops. That's funny. 
I jumped by accident to this slide, but that's good. Uh, yeah, this, this is my, so the, my friend John Lomberg, maybe you know John, John Lomberg, um, he's a space artist, he worked with Sagan on a lot of, illustrating a lot of his books, and actually, I'm working with him now on a really cool project that you guys should know about. John is spearheading this mission uh, called the One Earth Message Project, where we are trying to put a message on the New Horizons spacecraft as it goes by Pluto in July, then it's gonna head, it's gonna be the fifth man-made object to head outside the solar system, where we're gonna upload a message to its, um, its memory as it heads out of the solar system and uh, with a message from Earth. And uh, everybody's invited to be part of it. Check out the One Earth Meth Message Emis Initiative online. But anyway, so yeah, John's, you know, when we talk about um, the human influence, some people look at this, these rover tracks on Mars and they see uh, a desecration. It's like dune buggy tracks on a pristine beach. You know, how could we? bring this ugliness to this beautiful, pristine world. But there's another way to look at this. Think of those images of um, the continents before there was any life, the continents of Earth before there was any life, and those first little prints of, of paws and tails in, in the sand of the first life that ever crawled onto land, which is this beautiful thing, this evolutionary step. When I look at these tracks on Mars, that's what I see you know, an, a, an evolutionary step with, with all kinds of potential and possibility. And that's how I like to think of the human role in the universe. And if we guide ourselves in the right way, we can avoid this being the picture of the habitable zone where instead of too hot, too cold, and just right, you know, there's the danger that, that this would be the outcome. But I think that, you know, I'm actually, when I look at the long run, the cosmic view of humanity, and I'm about to stop and, and take your questions and comments, but I, I, I'm actually optimistic. I, I um, have this phrase that I like to think of as Terra Sapiens, the possibility of a wise Earth. And in fact, that is the title of the book that I'm finishing up now, which goes into more <clears throat> detail and all this stuff. Um, the notion of a, the possibility that we could be the beginning of this Sapiozoic era. And, um, but how, what, do we do, what do we need to do to get there? Well, we really do need to become a new kind of entity on this planet. And I think we have the tools to do it. We need to learn how to live comfortably over the long haul with our, our world changing, our planet changing technology. And I think the key to this is the, prop, the widespread propagation of a worldview that is global and is multi-generational. And the cool thing is I think this is actually happening. You can look at the news obviously today tomorrow, yesterday, and get discouraged. There's a lot of violence and factionalism and, let's face it, a, a rampant stupidity on this planet. And yet, I think if you step back and look at a longer time scale, there's a lot of really powerful changes leading to this global, kind of global identity. Um, we are a communicating, cooperating, storytelling species. Humanity really started out as human civilization started out at the end of the last ice age where we huddled around campfires and drew story, told, told stories, started making art and really cemented our identity as a communicating, group problem solving, future imagining species. That's who we are, that's the role we play on this planet and perhaps ultimately <coughs> elsewhere. Now, there's a sense in which we're huddled around new campfires. When you look at the Earth from space now, you see this, but there's also some, some other kind of change happening on this planet that I think is really fundamental that you don't see from space. And that's this, these growing semi-visible but very real webs of global connectivity and interaction. Global communications are facilitating, maybe painfully slowly, but in a real way, this new kind of global identity and multi-generational identity that ultimately I think is going to save us. Now, this is my second to last slide. Um, I've been working for the last couple of years in the Library of Congress on this book, Terra Sapiens, which I'm almost finished with. And one of my little side projects there has been something that I call a brief history of the future, where I've been reading a lot of prophecies about the future written in the past. Reading a lot of what, what smart people had to say a hundred years ago, a few hundred years ago, about our time, what they predicted. And it's very interesting to see the ways in which they were right, the ways in which they were wrong. And usually, I mean always, a lot of these people are, you know, there's a mix of uncanny wisdom where 
people, you know, people 100 years ago that really kind of predicted the internet and solar power, you know, these things that you go, how did they know that? Mixed with these complete blind spots because it's the game changers that you can't see coming that ultimately end up dominating the way history goes. But in all this reading, one of my favorite books has been this book, The World of Flesh and the Devil by J.D. Bernal. And it uh, was written in, um, I don't have the date here, but it's something like um, in the 20s, 1920 something. And no less a sage than Arthur C. Clarke called this book the most brilliant attempt at scientific prediction ever made. And uh, in case you don't have a chance to read this book, I urge you to read it. It's really amazing the things that he predicts about biotechnology and all this stuff. But uh, Bernal ends, and this is the final paragraph of the book, so I'm going to ruin it for you. But no, the, the end of the book, he goes, we hold the future still timidly, but perceive it for the first time as a function of our own action. Having seen it, are we to turn away from something that offends the very nature of our earliest desires? Or is the recognition of our new powers sufficient to change those desires into the service of the future, which they will have to bring about? It's a very good question. But I think, whoops, I skipped one. There we go. Um, I think that, uh, you know, as, as, as the song goes, the future is wide open. Technological innovation is changing our world in really surprising and accelerating ways. So possibilities that until recently seemed magical are, are, are imminent and, and the future therefore is frightening and exhilarating but above all it's unpredictable. Nobody knows what the world's going to be like 100 years from now. Climate modelers don't know it. Virtual reality technologists don't know. Sorry but they don't. Uh, you know nobody knows but uncertainty leaves a big avenue for hope and, and for choice and faith in ourselves and, and I think personally that we're just getting started on this planet. And that's all I have to say right now. Thank you very much. I'd be happy to take your questions.